Our next session is Championing Others' Rights and Their Own, Conversations Between Saurabh Kirpal and Jaina Kothari. Uh, before I hand over to the both of you, and I'm sure you'll have a lot to ask each other, let me quickly introduce you. Saurabh Kirpal, after studying physics at St. Stephen's College in Delhi, read law at the University of Oxford and did his master's in law at the University of Cambridge. He did a brief stint working with the United Nations in Geneva before returning to Delhi where he has been practicing at the Supreme Court for well over two decades. He has appeared in a range of matters covering a diverse range of subjects from commercial to constitutional law. He is presently fighting the case seeking recognition of same-sex marriage before the Delhi High Court. A self-described accidental activist, he is also a trustee of the NAS Foundation, the NGO that first fought for de decriminalization of homosexuality in India. He's the author of the recently released book, Sex and the Supreme Court, an anthology about issues relating to law, gender, and sexuality. Jaina. Jaina is a senior advocate and practices in the Supreme Court of India. She's also executive director of the Center for Law and Policy Research. She graduated from University Law College with a BA LLB degree and received the BCL degree from University of Oxford. Jaina was a Wrangler DC Pevet Fellow at the University of Cambridge. Jaina's research and practice interests include constitutional law, gender and sexuality law, disability rights, and decriminalization law. She had argued in the Supreme Court in the recent constitutional challenges to Section 377 of the IPC. She also argued the independent thought case in which the Supreme Court recognized child marital rape as a criminal offense. Her book, The Future of Disability Law in India, was published in 2012 by Oxford University Press. The floor is yours. Uh, I would love for the both of you to take over. Thanks for having us. Uh, Thank you. Yes. And, you know, uh, Jenna, let me just jump in and straight away, I've been dying to ask so many questions of you. Uh, you're quite the powerhouse, I must say, and I've really been a fan of your work from the time I saw you arguing the 377 matter as well. Uh, I didn't really know you before, but it's, it's a pleasure to get to know you thereafter. And I know you're a senior counsel of great eminence. And that's what I want to start off with, actually, Jenna, is that, you know, you've accomplished a fair bit in, in your life. You are a senior counsel. But tell me one thing. Is there at some level in our profession of law some amount of pigeonholing that happens? Uh, you run the Center for Policy Research. You are doing the disability law. Those are what I call social causes you find often that women are put in a category where they end up doing these kind of matters and the regular meaty commercial where the money is and where the big uh, fighter lawyers that seems to somehow be an area where women have not made their mark as much as in other areas why do you, is that true is my understanding true and what do you think if it is the reason for that Thanks, thanks, Saurabh, and uh, great to really uh, chat with you today. Uh, we've seen each other in the 377 case, uh, but we didn't really get a chance to interact. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and I have a lot of questions in my head, too, um, to ask you. Uh, but yeah, thanks for this. Um, I think it's a very uh, a pertinent question. Um, do women get? Do women end up getting pigeonholed? I think women women lawyers sometimes do end up getting pigeonholed and the usual kind of um, uh, legal issues, they are kind of sent and cases given our family law, just because you're a woman, you're supposed to be doing family law and uh, not so much human rights or social causes. Um, I feel perhaps it's because of you. It's, it's a little more visible now, you know. Uh, and there is a, I think there's a, uh, but what you said is a little bit right in the sense, you know, if a, if a very successful male uh, lawyer, like a male senior advocate would take up one or two uh, PILs, then it is seen that, oh, he's such a, uh, you know, well-rounded kind of lawyer. Uh, but if, a, but uh, when women take up a lot of PILs or human rights or social causes, uh, they do end up getting um stereotyped and oh you know this one just does pil work so she's perhaps not a very se serious lawyer um it's hard 
Um, so a little bit of that stereotyping does happen. Um, I think it, uh, but I think, you know, there are a lot of women who do um, different areas of very meaty, regular, hardcore, um, you know, fields of uh, litigation. I mean, you have uh, criminal lawyers, like you have Rebecca John, Nitya, and you know, all of them, I mean, they are such well-known um, criminal counsels. Um, you have uh, women doing commercial law, uh, but I think they are few, so we don't see too many of them. Um, and I think also like in, commer especially in um, commercial litigation, I think there are also these boys cliques, you know, the uh, firms send the cases to their friends who are counsels who end up who are men. And so, you know, there is a little bit of a boys club. So it's it's hard for women to also break through. But there have been, um, you know, there are, um, uh, you know, uh, women counsels doing uh, very successfully in these fields. But yeah, there are fewer. And we have to really kind of open up uh, that field, those fields. Indu, I was thinking of straight away, Indu Malhotra was the last. Uh... Yeah arbitration expert she became a judge yeah, of course of exactly and she had a very big commercial practice where she was yeah. really successful and she uh room up just as room up all. i mean you know she showed her um kind of strengths in uh, uh, commercial judgments um mm -hmm. so, you know we do have uh, we do have many of them yes. but let me ask you a question uh, uh, we could uh, you know since you put me on the spot um <laughs> Yeah. So what is, uh, you know, you've, uh, you're, uh, um, you have a really well, a good, pra big practice in the Delhi bar. Um, you've just been designated senior counsel. So congrats for that. Um, and you uh, took a lead role in the NAS judgment. And I think uh, what I find really brave is that um, you came out, you've come out quite openly about uh, um, yourself as being gay in the bar. Um, how, well, and we know how conservative and traditional the legal profession is. Um, that must have been quite hard. And how? what were some of the challenges in, in that? You know, uh, I think that is a kind of a nice segue to my question to you, is that while it may be hard to be uh, openly a queer lawyer in the profession, but because our profession is so gendered, and as you mentioned, the old boys network, and I was in the right spot to take full advantage of my privilege, right? A, I'm an upper caste man. I have the right surname. I come from a well-established legal family. I had this kind of a protective Teflon coating around me. Uh, so I could afford really to be a queer lawyer because I knew that no matter what, there'll be enough people who will take care of me, right? Now that's not an advantage everybody has. And that's part of the problem with the legal fraternity, I think, is that unless uh, you have someone who has put the hand over your head and guides you as your mentor, it's difficult to get ahead. I think that's that's certainly the, clearly the case. For me, I, I had that. Uh, I had people who were looking out for me. And I, I, I recognize that I come from a, a place of immense privilege. So I felt, Jaina, actually, that when I had that privilege, uh, I could either feel exploited and feel nothing about it, or feel guilty about it and sulk and be unhappy. Or I could use that privilege and try to help those who didn't have all that I did have. Right. So you asked me whether it was difficult to be a queer lawyer. Uh, no, it wasn't. Because when I appeared before uh, the judges, some a large number of them knew me as who I was already. So they didn't react to me in any manner other than just another lawyer. Uh, and that's what I felt is important, is that these young people who are joining the bar now, I find uh, they are trying to make a mark for themselves. They're trying to break through these barriers, and it's tough for them. So unless the people like you or me who have made the first move with whatever advantages we have had, unless we start laying down the path for them, uh, things will not improve. So, yes, at some level, of course, it was always a risk when I came out. And I say I have the privilege, but, you know, the privilege will only go that far. And it's no guarantee that uh, you will have complete protection because there have been many cases of people who have come from very worthy uh, backgrounds and completely tanked as lawyers. Maybe they were incompetent or whatever else. I don't know. So there's no guarantee. So, yes, it was a risk, 
But I think in my case, it was a calculated risk. And secondly, it was a calculated risk, uh, which my conscience propelled me towards, really. Uh, I felt this is something that I have to do uh, for the others. And you know, when you are in a bar, you have three categories of people you interact with. Uh, the judges, the other members of your bar, and finally, of course, clients. And, and this is kind of uh, a thought that I'm going to lead on and I'm going to ask you the question of what you think about this. Is that when I came out and, and I said I was part of the old boys clique already, that meant I knew people from the bar and the bench. So they knew me, so it was all right. The one imponderable in all of this was the clients. Uh, I was not too sure how they would react to a queer lawyer. Would they feel uncomfortable when they come to brief me? Uh, and it's it's true that you said earlier, in answer to your, my earlier question, that there's a bit of an old boys network and law firms will brief other lawyers they know. That's true, but if the client says no, ultimately the client's the boss. Right? So in my case, the biggest imponderable was would the clients come and support me? And, you know, I've been very lucky. I never felt any issue as far as that is concerned, partly because my practice is commercial litigation. I do a lot of commercial work. And in the commercial world, I think the top uh, companies don't really care about sexuality as much as someone else. Having said that, even the smaller clients who came to me, I didn't get the feeling were ever bothered about my sexuality. If I could deliver in court, that was the only metric that I think seemed to matter to them. But this is another thing I, I, I wonder about. How is it for women? You know, I, I, I made this tri, uh, tripartite distinction. How do you think judges react and the bar reacts and the client reacts to when you have a woman? When I, I've heard a lot of my female friends complain about this, that clients just react in a very different way. How, how, what has your experience been like on this front? Uh, my experience um, has actually been quite positive. Um, actually, the most positive has been with clients, uh, you know. And uh, ultimately, you know, clients are just happy if you deliver. Um, there was initially, uh, you know, when I just started out my practice, um, that, uh, you know, clients would talk to me on the phone and then come and meet me and they would be a little shocked. I could see the shock on their face because, um, uh, I mean, they knew I'm a woman, but they didn't know how young I was or how young I looked. Um, and so they were, they would be a little taken aback, but that was just momentarily, you know, as uh, the minute they know that you're thorough with their work and with their case, um, the trust develops and uh, they see you delivering they see you uh, uh, doing um, you know standing up for them in court and that's at the end of the day that's all that matters so i've really uh, been very lucky with not having any issues with uh, clients uh, from day one actually uh, with uh, in the bar initially it was a bit tough um, you know i think in the bar uh, of course, gender plays a role, but I think more than even gender, it's age that plays a role. Um, I felt that in my younger days, um, just being a young rookie lawyer was a disadvantage, whether you're male or female. And, um, you know, so you really had to push yourself out. Other lawyers would try and senior lawyers would kind of uh, you know, uh, put, you know, kind of take up space and not let you speak. Judges would, some of the judges may be a little patronizing, but not all. I think judges are also looking out for youngsters to, you know, really um, do their case well, and they're happy if they do. So initially, it, it did take some time, but, uh, but it was, uh, you know, I would have um, court, the court officers say, you know, Madam, go get your senior. And I would say like, well, I have no senior, you know. So, Initially, so I think that was fine. And um, so to some extent, you know, you the, you need the gray hair and it's harder, I think, for women to kind of, it is, you know, if you, if you don't look older, it's uh, a bit tough. But uh, just kind of moving, you know, continuing a little bit, I was thinking, you know, from your previous question that you felt that you, you know, you felt uh, that you did have to, uh, uh, you know, come out. Did you, I mean, I think that must have been quite inspiring for younger members of the bar. Uh, and do you do you think uh, that kind of uh, gave 
it, you know, allowed a lot of younger members to be open about themselves in whatever way, you know. Do you think that inspired a few younger people? I think it did, but it was never my intention, Jaina. Uh, I think I had a compelling need to come out and do the 377 case and, as I said, be the accidental activist that I am today, which I never intended or set out to be it. But I just found these causes calling out to me. And that's why I, I started doing them. Uh, as a gay person, uh, you know, when the 2013 Kaushal judgment came, I was uh, personally offended that the Supreme Court of India, where you know you and I practice, walk down the corridors of the court every day, doesn't even have it in its heart to allow me to have the freedom of sleeping with a person I sleep with in the privacy of my own bedroom. And that they will potentially send me, who appears before them, uh, to jail. So I, I really felt offended about it. And it was a visceral, deep anger on my part that first made me get involved with the movement. Uh, but then, yes, you're right, as time passed, and I noticed this increasingly, is that there is somewhat of a mentorship role that, that develops, right? Uh, a lot of young queer members uh, reach out to me, uh, they're either in the closet, then secretly through uh, messages or whatever else. And I try to speak to as many as I can. Uh, and I think that's very important. I think the problem in our country, especially, is the absence of role models. Yeah. That is tied really with the absence of discussion on the issue of sexuality. Uh, you know, it's a taboo subject. No one talked about it, at least till 377 judgment. I think there were only quiet sniggers uh, when we mentioned the word gay or lesbian, or, because there were caricatures, there were stereotypes. Uh, it was funny, but it was still something taboo uh, under the uh, carpet. And I think the 377 judgment has done that, uh, which is to bring a topic of sexuality out of the closet, not just the people. Yeah. But in that, I felt that people have now got increasing courage to at least reach out to me. Whereas I thought, I saw that even till the 377 verdict had come, uh, there were a few people who were queer. Uh, they may have reached out. But there wasn't that much of a, they didn't even make that effort to come and speak to me or to or to the two other people who were openly gay at, at that point of time in, in, in the courts. And there were not very many of us. They're not, there's still not very many of us uh, queer people out in, in court. But there is a whole groundswell of people. I think the youth of the country is qualitatively different from what we were. We were slightly scared. We were slightly nervous. I think the youth are impatient. And, uh, you know, they're willing to fight for their rights in a way that, uh, you know, a lot of people in my generation were not. Uh, and I think some part of that is, I, I, I do hope, is that they look up to mentors and to, to role models. Uh, so we have to do that for them. We have to be out there. And I think I suppose it's the same for women. Uh, I, I really, and that's, that's maybe a, uh, your best place to answer, is that... Uh, you know, do you think there are sufficient role models uh, uh, as women? And and how about taking a specific example? The fact that there is only one Supreme Court judge in uh, who's a female in the Supreme Court today. Uh, how does that work to the younger bar? How how does it translate into their feeling about their role in? And, and I'm talking women here. The uh, uh, the women in the bar. As to do, does it make uh, an impact saying that this is a constitutional court of my country and you can't even have more than one out of 34 as women? How does that uh, impact, uh, you think, women? Yeah, I mean, you, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, you need role models. And um, if women are, as women lawyers are aspiring to be judges, they need to see women judges, you know, they need to see their high courts and Supreme Court kind of filled with women judges to uh, say that, yes, that can be something I can reach to, you know, and that's a possibility. But if you just see one or two women judges in the Supreme Court and just three or four women judges or four or five in the high court, then it is very daunting, you know, because you feel that 
uh, you know, you have to be, you know, uh, you have to have all kinds of impossible requirements to make it. You'll never make it. So let me not even aspire to it, you know. Um, and the same is, uh, you know, in other roles as well. You Today, you don't have that many advocate generals who are women, um, solicitor generals who are women. Uh, you know, you're just having now, I think, one or two in the Supreme Court. But we've never had uh, an AG or SG who's a woman um, and in the high courts as well. And, you know, these are positions uh, uh, that uh, all lawyers, especially, you know, including women lawyers should aspire to. Uh, but we need role models there, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and if you don't see enough role models, you feel uh, a lot of women uh, um, aspirants can feel, well, what's the point of trying so hard? They'll never select me because they don't select women. You know, so, um, so yeah, role models, the more you see, I mean, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, well, I mean, I'm sure you know that when someone asked her, how many judges on the Supreme Court do you need to be to feel really happy? And she said, nine, nine women, you know. Uh, <laughs> so we are not even halfway. And, and, and not just uh, the judiciary, I suppose, even in Parliament, and it's the absence of uh, representation. Uh, but I, it ends up being tokenism. But do you think it's uh, still at least a good idea to have tokenism as opposed to nothing? I totally agree. I mean, I think we still need, uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it tokenism, but, uh, you know, some inclusion, even if it's not a full representation, uh, mm. uh, you know, to say that, yes, we do need women. And, you know, some of these things we would raise at least, you know, when names for elevation or any other positions go up. I mean, I think we have to ensure that there are some women there. And it's it's not to say that you don't have meritorious women to uh, include, you know. It's not that you're, in, you're including women just for tokenism who are not meritorious. Right. I think we have, um, uh, you know, we have a vibrant legal community where you have, you know, no shortage of really qualified meritorious women. And uh, so I think, I mean, it has to start somewhere. Um, but, but that's it, it's true. But you know, I feel I'm sorry, I'm just asking this question. Yeah, I'm really yeah, curious yeah, about yeah. on it. Is that while there are a lot of women at the entry level, there's just a glass ceiling that they seem to hit yeah. at some point of time. Yeah. There's such few senior. You talk, talked of no attorney general or solicitor general. Uh, there are such few senior counsels as well in the in various courts. Why do you think it's is that? I mean. Uh, there, of course, there's, everything is gendered, right? So law is just another profession as well. But I think the law is peculiar in as much as uh, the entry level, there's so many women who are so qualified and brilliant. What happens? Yeah. You know, I mean, we had the experience, um, you know, now the, you know, just responding to your senior counsel question. Um, and you went through that because now there are new rules, right? You have an application process. I mean, before this, it was even more harder, right? Because it's all kind of an unsaid, non-transparent way of um, making senior counsel. But now it, there's a transparent process. But the glass ceiling is there. So unless you see role models, like let me just give you the Karnataka example. Karnataka, before this round, had just one woman senior counsel. Uh, just one. And with this, uh, with the round uh, uh, recently in 2018, uh, there were three senior counsels uh, who were women. Uh, who were uh, designated. Uh, but, you know, at that time, we were talking, uh, we had very few women applying. And that's, you know, that answers your question. Uh, you know, we were, we were actually me and a couple of other women lawyers were like, why aren't more women applying? You know, uh, because we certainly did feel that there were many more women who had they applied, stood a very good chance. And a lot of them don't, didn't apply because a, they felt, they assumed that they wouldn't get selected. They assumed that they wouldn't select women. Uh, that they felt that the burdens or standards for them would be much higher or tougher. And a lot of men would just kind of breeze through. And uh, also uh, were afraid that if, what if we don't make it? Would it, how would it affect our profession then? But you know, a lot of these things, it's like from school, right? A lot of boys are just so like confident that they will just answer and open their mouth in class, even if they don't know the answer. And girls are like still so 
uh, hesitant. You know, I have to know the right answer. So we have to break some of these uh, myths uh, and barriers uh, for the gates to open. I mean, we have to open the gates, uh, you know. Um, so, okay, let me like uh, quiz you a bit. Uh, what has, I mean, you spoke about the NAS, uh, I mean, the, sorry, the Naftej case. And um, uh, obviously it, it was something personally uh, uh, very important, but what was your experience? I mean, it was such a historic moment, wasn't it? The whole litigation, I mean, I was part of it, but what, what was your experience of the litigation before, after, whatever, what stood out? And well, I can't answer that question too well because then people won't go out and buy my book. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 And saying, like, if you want a more detailed answer, kindly purchase the book. But a uh, teaser, you know. <laughs> a little teaser I can certainly give you. Uh, yeah, it was a roller coaster, Jenna. Really, it really was a roller coaster. I told you I was so angry uh, uh, when that judgment had come. But then I went through those whole five stages of grief, which I don't have to uh, reiterate here. But I, I, when we decided to file that petition, for uh, Navde Johar, we never thought that it would be the lead petition and be decided. Our idea always was that we'll file this petition to cure a particular lacuna, legal lacuna that exists in the curative petitions in the NAS Foundation. Now, I realize that uh, a large amount of our audience is not legally literate. Let me just give a, a one minute background as, as to what, what had happened is that when the Supreme Court decided against uh, decriminalization, uh, a curative petition had been filed, which allowed the court a legal tool to, to relook at its own judgment. But the grounds on which it could relook were very limited. Uh, it had to be, for instance, that they did not hear one of the parties, or it was so wrong that no one could possibly have taken such a decision. Now, those were very tenuous legal grounds, and they were ner you know, we were a bit nervous. So that's why Navtej's case was filed as a supplement. But uh, come January of 2018, uh, I was speaking to Menika and suddenly, uh, because we were doing this case together, the Chief Justice, then Justice Mishra, just decided to list this particular matter out of turn in his court. And we were very nervous because we didn't know why has this matter been picked out and put for hearing because it had been tagged with the curative petitions. It was meant to be heard with the curatives, but this was picked out and heard. So we didn't really know what the intention of the court was. Uh, and then, of course, he referred the matter to a bench of five judges after the first hearing. And that was shortly before the summer break uh, that the matter was going to five judges. And then in the summer break, we figured out that uh, it was going to be a bench of five judges. And the moment we heard the constitution of the bench of five judges, uh, I think most of us knew we'd won the case. Uh, there was Chief Justice Mishra, uh, whose political ideology one didn't really know. But he obviously thought this was a case important enough to be heard by the Supreme Court on a priority basis because there were a large number of constitution bench matters which were pending, which had not been listed, but this one was. Then there was Justice Khanvelkar, Justice Chandrachud, Justice Nariman, and Justice Malhotra, all four of them from metro cities, all of them very liberal judges, all with great practices. And we all knew they were fairly sympathetic, you know, publicly and privately, I must confess that they were sympathetic to the cause of the LGBTQIA community. So uh, there was a fair bit of optimism going into uh, into the hearings. But you know, as you know more better than anyone else, that nothing is fin final in court uh, till the verdict actually comes. One of the problems we had was how was, how was the government going to react? Because all this while the government had not filed its reply to the petition, we did not know what stand it would take. Until the last moment, the government sought adjournments, saying that give us time, give us time, give us time. We want to file a reply. Uh, and Chief Justice Mishra stood firm and said, no, I'm not going to give you time. And then we argued our matter. You would you'd argue the matter. We all argued. I argued some bit of it. Uh, the hearing seemed to go really brilliantly. And then when the government's turn came, that's when they filed the affidavit, if you recollect. And luckily, and I, I can't tell you about the backroom shenanigans, some part of which I know, which I, you know, we'll do a charcha over something better than chai, uh, maybe over <laughs> something more sparkly and bubbly once, Jenna, you and I, and I'll tell you. Uh, so the government came out with this affidavit, which was uh, at the least neutral. And, you know, that was 
the least I could, the most I could hope in the government, and that was fine. And once the verdict was over, I think the writing was on the wall. But still, nothing can explain the joy and the happiness uh, I felt on the day the verdict came. Uh, personally, I'd had a bit of a shocker the day before uh, when my own no name had been uh, deferred one day before, but I, I knew that was happening. But in spite of that, uh, the, the absolute sense of freedom that I felt uh, the day the judgment came, um, I felt like shouting from the rooftops. As I think not only the queer community, but every right thinking person. I mean, you, for instance, a uh, great ally. Uh, I think there is in our country a decent streak of humanity, tolerance. Sometimes we see so many dark clouds, Jaina, that we think that there is only evil that is left behind, that there's only uh, horrible things left. And that's just so not true. You know, there's a lot of joy and there are a lot of good people in our country. And I'd say the vast majority, forget how anyone votes, the vast majority of our country are, are a decent lot of people. I have faith in the humanity of our country. And I saw uh, the best example of that was the 377 judgment. You know, had we been an intolerant, homophobic society, we would have seen demonstrations on the road. We would have seen some kind of agitation against the judgment. But and there was only, only was celebration, right? And there was only celebration. Yes. It was only celebration, yeah. Yeah. And there was there was so much happiness. Uh, and that's probably what's caused, I think, this outpouring also of sense of confidence in the young people. That they feel today that the Supreme Court of India has got my back. And if the Supreme Court can say this is all right, then maybe it is. So, it, you know, people in big cities may not need this. But I think someone in a small town, a Mufasil town, or in a village somewhere, once they read about this judgment, I don't know, very many people probably would not have read the text of the judgment. And that's another problem we have is our judgments are written in such turgid language that uh, it's an inaccessible. I mean, you read a US Supreme Court judgment, any person can read it, any lay person. But we don't have that. Uh, that's our style of legal writing. But in any case, they must have read the short part of it in, uh, in newspapers. And that completely gave them uh, the courage to come out and, and celebrate. But, you know, you were also in this case, Jaina. So what was your experience uh, in it? What what brought you into this case? What uh, I, I'd like to hear your perspective on it, because mine is very clearly personal. I'd like to see yours. Yeah. So we, uh, I mean, I represented uh, three trans activists in the case. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of got into the case in 2016, uh, very soon after the Nalsa judgment. Um, just again for the audience, uh, uh, in 2014, the uh, Supreme Court laid down quite a landmark judgment um, uh, recognizing the right to gender identity. And that, uh, you know, after that judgment, so I was working um, uh, quite closely with um, trans activists and there was uh, great excitement after this judgment. And then we started thinking, hey, how does this, uh, how will this now impact the 377 curative petition? Uh, because now the Supreme Court is actually recognizing the right to gender identity and uh, sexual orientation in a in a in a in a, in a veiled way, but certainly gender identity. And uh, so we we were working on filing a new petition, and we did that. And it was, uh, I think, one of the reasons was certainly the Nalsa decision, but another reason was also that I think the trans community uh, felt that uh, they needed a voice, a clear voice in this fight, uh, because they were for too long uh, just at the back end, you know, just part of the LGBTQI. And it was not really them and their stories which were out, you know. Uh, and um, so then we filed this petition and uh, then it was tagged, like, you know, with the curative. And, and it all happened quite coincidentally, because I think you guys were working on the petition uh, and we were working on it and, you know, our petition was actually listed very, you know, just a few days after yours and, and it was all kind of all happening uh, in different parts of the country at the same time. But yeah, when the, when the case was listed for hearing, I think everyone was surprised because it was taken out of turn. Um, I, rem I remember kind of, you know, rushing to Delhi. Um, now even going to Delhi seems like uh, normal, but, you know, we rushed to Delhi 
and uh, two of the petitioners i was representing three of them two of the petitioners came along too um you know they had difficulty getting through the supreme court despite the aor having passes made for them at the gate uh they were waiting at the gate um uh, and messaging me that you know people are staring at us uh because they are obviously trans and they're like you know we're not allowed in uh finally they got in um and you know so so you kind of see how um um you know they, they were there to hear their case and uh they constantly were faced with the same discrimination and stigma that we were actually fighting about uh they got in and uh you know they were there to hear the arguments and then i mean there was just so much excitement i think which was palpable in the court right with so many you know lawyers um, students journalists petitioners i mean it was like a mela in some way um and then after the case when the verdict came it was i mean it uh, i was in bangalore you guys were all in delhi uh and then when the verdict came uh i was on my way back in the afternoon from court and there were parties i mean you know on the streets and uh, you know akai called and said you have to come to the town hall um uh, and then you know we have a town hall and we went there and there were you know media there was media coverage everywhere there was the flag you know the the rainbow flag and people were screaming and shouting and i still remember akai kind of uh um, saying to one of the journalists that today is our independence day um today is our independence uh, really um so you know pick up on that um uh, you know and and you said it was an independence day really for the queer community the way it was independence day for women in india in 1950 theoretically but 75 years down the line i really wonder how much has changed for women and equally 2 years down the line i really wonder how much has changed for the trans community in particular mm-hmm. i think because if you have a caste system in the in the queer community the the really the outcast would still be uh, the trans community i think that doubly uh, double by me there uh, it's 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 really is a yeah it, it i mean a, i i think there have been uh, you know i think the judgment has brought in mm-hmm. um, a lot i mean the recognition and the um you know uh, openness to talk about these issues of course we have a long way to go and i i feel even you know of course the trans community is um uh, is working on many of these issues i i mean i don't think even for other members of the queer community it's been a bed of roses but i think the judgment has paved the way at least for us to kind of fight on and the uh, i think the larger message really the larger impact is to women too to say that uh, you can be what you want to be isn't that really the message uh, you know and how do we kind of uh, uh, put that in our practice uh, as lawyers as members of the legal profession <laughs> true uh, because sometimes i think we talking about gender but we become so binary that we do forget and i think it just comes naturally to people to talk of gender in the binary and we forget the trans whole trans community and i think that's something we should be aware of and only then can we actually start to get uh, address that problem yeah and yeah. also address larger intersect other intersections as well uh intersections within the lgbti community of trans and intersex persons but other intersections of caste religion uh of class um and other minorities so yeah the, the, i think that is the bigger battle you know um yeah we have seerat there again uh, <laughs> i feel quite guilty about <laughs> stopping the both of you but this was a truly fascinating conversation and i got goosebumps jaina when you were mentioning how dr kai said it said it's independence day for the community um and sort of we hope you told us the backroom shenanigans and you're not invited to the uh, champagne it seems but uh, thank you so very much both of you for the conversation um we unfortunately need to get to our next session thanks for having us thank you thank you um our next session is um grassroots change we have leaders from civil society organizations will be back soon uh, with sohini bhattacharya and shraddha joshi in a bit so please do stay put so jana i'll tell you another time the full backroom shenanigans how yeah, it catch up lovely lovely chatting with you sarav lovely well it really was thanks bye, bye.